Hello! This video is, as the title suggests, my April reading wrap-up. Don't say it, we're not discussing it, we're just gonna talk about the books that I read in April. The first book that I finished in the month of April was Song of Achilles by Madeline Miller. This book is about Patroclus. I'm actually not entirely sure how you say his name. I should have looked that up before I started recording. Uh, but he is an awkward young prince who is exiled to a foreign court where he meets the dashing young prince Achilles. The two become best friends and eventually lovers. I guess that is in theory a spoiler, but I refuse to treat identity as an off limit spoiler. And if that's a problem, you can fight me or like really you should just like unsubscribe and leave me alone. Anyway, this book is an explicitly queer reimagining of the story of Achilles from the vantage point of his best friend turned lover. The writing as with Cersei is gorgeous and wonderful. The pacing is excellent. I loved basically everything about this and I gave it five out of five stars. The next book that I finished was Slayer by Kirsten. In White. This book is the first in what I assume will be a new series of YA novels set in the Buffyverse after the events of both the seven seasons of the show and the comics, which I never read. I read this book for Star Squad Pod and you can hear an extended version of all of my thoughts on this book, uh, as well as uh, Sam from Thoughts on Tomes, who we talked about it with uh, on the podcast, which I will link in the description. Before I say anything else, I will leave by saying that this book was like really disappointing. I'm not gonna bother explaining too much of the Buffyverse lore, uh, but our main character, Nina, is the child of Watchers. And she would have been a little kid when the council was attacked and presumably destroyed in the final season of the show. The council was presumed obliterated and the last vestiges of it went underground and had no contact with any of the many slayers who were activated in the finale of the show. So because of the contentious relationship between Watchers and Slayers and her particular upbringing, Nina hates Slayers and Buffy in particular. But then, aha, she becomes one, the last one, in fact, because the source of all magic is destroyed at the beginning of the book uh, and she is activated from potential to Slayer like at the last possible second before magic is destroyed and gone from the world forever. Coming from the sort of rich lore of the show, the idea here was really cool. You take someone who knows about Slayers, but she's actually like with the Watchers. And so she has all this enmity for the Slayers, but now she's becoming this thing that she was trained to hate. Unfortunately, we're never really given a compelling reason for Nina's hatred. In fact, we just hear Nina constantly thinking about things that we saw Buffy do, but like she's thinking about them in really terrible and reductive ways. Again, the idea is good. Show those same events from a different perspective. You know, as Buffy was rebelling against the Watchers, like what is that other perspective? In theory, generally speaking on the show, when Buffy is rebelling against the Watchers, he's rebelling against a like really gross patriarchal structure. So you have to do something really clever and inventive. If you're gonna try to find a way to flip that on its head in a YA novel. And this book didn't do that. In fact, the book is so heavily telegraphing the fact that Nina is going to come around and like empathize with Buffy that all of the arguments that Nina is sharing, whatever, against Buffy are, are like, hollow, like they're nothing. So for like hundreds of pages, this really like hollow, flimsy YA protagonist character is ragging on this other really cool character who is the entire reason that I am picking this book up in the first place. And she's complaining about her for wholly nonsensical and incredibly repetitive reasons. As a fan of the show and of Buffy the character, it was infuriating to listen to Nina constantly defend the like patriarchal bullshit of the council and fail to have any empathy for Buffy. Especially when going into this, I have empathy for Buffy. I don't have any yet for Nina. Even though I was desperately like hoping the book would give me a reason to have it. It's also a plot built on miscommunication, which is not like an inherent flaw in storytelling necessarily. Uh, it is definitely something that I personally hate. Nobody tells anybody anything and every major plot point could have been resolved with a fucking conversation. It was really cool to be back in the Buffyverse. There, Buffy is present <laughs> in this book uh, and there were one or two other small things that I did not hate. And on the basis of those things, I originally gave this book two out of five stars, but after the passage of an amount of time that we are not discussing, I realized just how poorly this one sits in my feelings. Uh, so I think I'm gonna go back on Goodreads or whatever and bump this down to one star because 
I, I hated it. Next, I read White Rage, The Unspoken Truth of a Racial Divide by Carol Anderson. This is a nonfiction book that essentially details 150 years of US racial history, specifically through the lens of, as the title suggests, white rage. Anderson lays out quite compellingly that this history is one in which angry white people are repeatedly pushing back on opportunities for black progress. This started out as a Washington Post op-ed, I believe, in response to media outlets framing protests around like black rage. And so she basically wrote a whole fucking book saying like, if you really wanna see rage, like let's talk about centuries of racist white people because they seem really fucking angry. This book manages to distill a lot of information down into a very small and accessible package. I mean, I'd say accessible, there are definitely parts of it that are very hard to read, that is unavoidable. What I mean by accessible here is that the language itself is not like heady or excessively academic. If you have spent a lot of time reading about this history, there's not a lot of new information here, but I do think that it would still be worth reading for that framing device alone. It is definitely a book that I would recommend to somebody looking to understand the history of race in America better, and I gave this book four out of five stars. The next book that I finished in the month of April was Daisy Jones and the Six by Taylor Jenkins Reid. This was also a podcast episode with Kat and my friend Devin, and I will link that in the description as well. The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo was one of my favorite books of 2018, so I was really excited about this one. I listened to this one on audio, and it has a full cast recording that is really, really fantastic, though after doing the podcast, I think that the best way to read this book is in combination with the audiobook and either an ebook or a physical copy of the book. I mean, this is like generally my favorite way to read things, but with this one in particular, because it is written as a transcript and then you have that full cast production, I really do actually think that there's a value add from both reading it formatted uh, and then also the wonderful performances of the cast. The story itself is told very much in the style of a VH1 behind the music episode about this band of fictional musicians, which again is why the kind of like full cast recording and then the like transcript format. I think having both of those things would probably enhance your experience of this book. The fictional Daisy Jones was a solo artist who made one incredibly successful record in the 70s, I think, with a band called The Six. The whole like conceit of the story is that they're all being interviewed about how they all got their start in music, how they came together, and then how their collaboration eventually imploded. There are some narrative devices that worked really well in Evelyn Hugo that did not work as well for me in this book. And something that we learn at the end of the novel changed the way that I felt about the rest of it. And there's no way for me to talk about that without spoilers, but again, I, I explained this in full detail on the podcast. Other than that, this was super fun. I own the audiobook, so I'm sure I will re-listen to it at some point. The format was super cool and engaging. Daisy Jones is a fucking mess and I love her, not quite as much as Evelyn, but I do love Daisy. Taylor Jenkins Reid is really good at writing these like complicated, messy, main characters who you still really, really root for. Uh, I love this book and I gave it four out of five stars. The last book that I read in the month of April was Girls of Paper and Fire by Natasha Nyan. This is a YA fantasy novel where we follow a young girl who is abducted and brought to the capital city of her kingdom where she is forced to be a concubine to the king. There's something going on with the fact that she is human and like humans are the lesser race. There's like a lot of sort of mythical races and like humans are sort of at the bottom of the barrel but she's like a super special human. I, I, the details are very hazy because of the amount of time that we're not talking about since I read this book. If I remember correctly, the magic of the world was fairly subtle, but like there was a lot of it there kind of lingering. Um, but I remember feeling like it was kind of a, a mashup of a lot of stuff that I had already seen before. Like the, the magic was not a heavy draw of the book, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. The main thing recommending this book for me is that our protagonist falls in love with one of the other concubines. Um, and the, I think the story handles her realization that she is queer really, really well. Again, uh, identity, not a fucking spoiler. We've we covered this already, right? Anyway, that's the sort of big piece of it that I do remember is like, is feeling like that thread was well handled. This book is the first in a series. The second one I think came out just recently and I will probably wind up reading it eventually, though I was a little bit disappointed with the, I don't know, twist at the end that sets us up 
for the the sequel. Like I, I think it was not necessary. Again, I don't really even remember what it was, but I do remember that I didn't like it. Uh, all in all, I remember very little about this book, but I liked it and I gave it three out of five stars. And that is everything that I read in April. If you read any of these books and you want to talk to me about them, maybe jog my memory a little bit, I don't know, uh, let's, let's discuss in the comments. Hopefully I will be back again soon with my May reading wrap up, but what is the passage of time anyway? Bye.